So the whole purpose of James is let's take things from thought and that's a good idea or I should do that, I shouldn't do that and turn it into action. So today we're going to kind of keep it that same theme. I'm going to jump right into the verses first. So when I read my Bible, my favorite way to read it is I go to my computer and I copy like a chapter I want to read or a couple of chapters. Then I delete out all of the numbers. I delete out all the headings. So there's no verses telling me what I'm going to see and there's no headings telling me what I'm about to read. And then I read it like a letter. And it really changes the way you read things sometimes. So that's why I've tossed it up today, using the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I'm just going to read. You want to throw those verses up there? You can't hear me? Closer or further? It might block part of my face. but All right. So James chapter 3, we're going to start out. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who is also able to control his whole body. Now when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide the whole animal. And consider ships. Though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, the tongue is a small part of the body. It boasts great things. Consider how large a forest a small fire ignites, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. Every sea creature, reptile, bird, or animal is tamed and has been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. We praise our Lord and Father with it, and we curse men who are made in God's likeness with it. Praising and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a saltwater spring yield fresh water. Then we'll put a quick prayer here. Heavenly Father, we come to this uh, verse, these verses, this part of James, the admonishment, and it, it seems um, overwhelming. When I read this, God, you're telling me I can't tame my tongue, but then you're telling me to tame my tongue. You say, no man can do it, but you're then telling me to do it. Open our eyes and our minds and our hearts. Let us dig back into our past, consider our present, and look to our future as we address this area of life, which is so important. Were it not so, you wouldn't be so direct with us through your prophet James. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I asked the guys at the front table to do me a favor this morning. I like when people, I've done this many times, take just like a Bible verse that means something to you and just do a sketch. Now, I've done this before, and some people draw beautiful sketches, you know, like rainbows and sunshine and, and flowing hair. And just They're a really good artist. And then there's us. Stick figures and little symbols. But symbology and drawing can mean a lot because art, you know, real art, it, it, it's just, it inspires me. So I asked the guys up front, Gary, uh, you probably can't see this, uh, gave me uh, a sun and a nothing symbol under it. And it's very simple. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. So it's a nice little symbology. Nice job. I appreciate that, Gary. It kind of makes you think a little bit. That's a good thing that I could maybe stick in my car, right? In times of trouble, consider that. And then Jake, this was really creative. He drew a large heart, and inside of that a world, and inside of that a cross. Who wants to guess what verse that is? John 3.16, right? That's a nice... Again, I, I like the way you just kind of synthesize that down to something very simple. And Steve, you did... I don't get it. This is junk. <laughs> You know, I ask you to do something as a friend, and you give me this. Seriously. I did my best. No, I don't think you did, because that you would have been better than that. That's just whatever, dude. How does that feel? I'm going to take us back to one of the verses here. I'm going to I'm going to say something here. I'm going to can you throw up Proverbs? I got the the Bible. So when we talk about the tongue, we're really talking about words, aren't we? Because it's just a piece of meat. Some people eat them. Anybody eat cow's tongue? Right? It's just it's a muscle in there. People eat them. You shouldn't, but you do. Um, it's really the words we're talking about. When, when the Bible references our tongue, it's because that's what we used to speak. And we all know that speaking, and, and I could pull, I mean, there was literally just, I'd probably say, some ridiculous number of, of places in the Bible that talk about the tongue. 
but I, I, there's some I like. I'm a Proverbs geek. Uh, life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I can encourage Jake and Gary with a drawing, and then I can beat Steve up over his. I go back to James where it says, and this, this is a conviction I have, partly because of my time in the military shaped my world and shaped my view for a long season. And I'll be very candid. There was a time when I'd look at a person and say, they need to just be put away. They're dogs, they're animals. These people know nothing. They have no respect for humanity. We need to just eliminate these people. And some days now, I can even look at uh, people that are at a different, totally... I, I'm, I look at some... My parents live in California. I look at some of the things that are happening there within the culture and that the government are passing, and I'm thinking, could you people be more stupid? And the next week, they prove they can't, yeah. right? <laughs> it's very easy for me to turn to people and say, you are so a waste of life. You are a do-nothing, no-good terrorist. You are destroying the schools. You're destroying our culture. You're evil. And then I come to a verse like this. Verses like this convict me. The paper that I was insulting here, the, the, what you drew, Steve, was just, I, it's, I'm just going to call it garbage. See, that paper felt nothing. But I'm insulting the creator of the paper. My words and what I say and feel about that piece of paper to him are insulting the one who created that. So when I look at God, and I thank him for those of you in this room, I thank him for my family, for my parents, for the pastors we have, for the, for the people that come in our lives, then with the same tongue, I turn to people and say, that person should be put to death. That one's a loser. That one's an idiot. God, take them out of here. Fix this government. Fix this state. Fix these people. Fix these schools. Get the idiots out of the way. What am I really saying? God, you're a good God, but you made a lot of mistakes, and we're calling them humans. Would you just get rid of these people you created? Forget the fact that they're your children. Forget the fact that they're lost. And forget the fact that well, their sin was so much worse than any of mine, I think. I feel like sometimes Jonah. And I am guilty of telling people, brother, love you, pray for you. And then, are you kidding me? And I, I have that in my heart more because I've learned it's unwise to say those things, but yet I still feel them. And in some company, it's easy for me to get down around a bunch of people I believe the same way they believe. Fairly conservative values. There is a God. There, I have a faith-based view of the world. The Bible is my compass. And it's sometimes with those people, I can really let down my guard and start hammering God's children. The lost ones, the corrupt ones. I guarantee I would have been one of those people that said, no, Saul is not coming here. We've got no use for that guy. He should have been put to death a long time ago. God, take him off this earth. If, if I were God back then, there would have been no Paul. One of my dearest friends here in Minnesota, John Turnipseed, was one of the, uh, well, he was the leader of the most notorious gang. There was a period of time, I didn't live here then, where somebody came in and did a documentary called Murderapolis. It was his gang that was fomenting all of that uh, disaster. And many people probably wished him dead. But he died about a year and a half ago and in the last 20 years of his life, he became a pastor, and at least 2,000 men turned their lives around and got connected to their kids through a ministry that he ran, developed uh, with Art Erickson, and it was an amazing thing, and I met many of the guys that had been through the program. Uh, John became a dear friend, and I always told him, I should just call you Paul. So when I see people, and I'm reminded, in, in the words in James, how can the same mouth that praises God turn around and say evil, and particularly when it comes to what God's created. I'm going to jump over to a, another quick example here, another proverb. The one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to repeat for some who haven't heard it. I, I was in uh, Georgia working as the executive pastor of a church, and a dear friend of mine, Ernie Simmons, and I, we had a routine of going to a, a biscuit house and having a cup of coffee. And so as usual in most of these places, there's, there's a group of guys that look a lot like those of you at the table here, retired and having their coffee, and that was their morning thing. Well, we're sitting no further away than this table here, and for that particular day, whatever, they felt the need to just kind of break down the church where I was the executive pastor, making fun of, oh, it's all that construction they're building. It was just, it was just kind of, a, it was like five minutes of, of really, guys? And they, they know I can hear them. And so my back's there a little to my right, and I'm sitting across from Ernie. He could see me getting bothered. And at a certain point, I said, you know, you hear what they're saying about the church and 
about Jesus. He says, yeah, they're having a pretty good time over there, aren't they? He said, well, I feel like I need to go over there and say something. And he's older and wiser than me, and yes, there are people older than me. And he said, well, you probably need to go run on over there and do that then, if it's the Holy Spirit telling you to do it. If it's just your ego or your pride, or if you think you need to go defend God's reputation, he's plenty capable of defending his own. So if God's put that on your heart, you go right ahead. Jump on over there and you get engaged with them gentlemen. But if God didn't put that on your heart, we might just want to sit here and have our coffee. The one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. I'm reminded, I've been telling my kids this their whole life. You have 100% control of the actions you take. You have control over the actions you don't take. But you have no control over the consequences of either. You don't get to control the consequences of your actions. You don't. They come to you in ways you don't expect, the unintended consequences you never imagined. They were probably about 10, 8, and 6 in the backyard one day throwing snowballs at each other. And every once in a while, I look out and I see a snowball sailing over the fence, and there's a road that goes right by our house, 167th Street. I'm like, that's probably not a good idea. So I said, I said, boys, I see snowballs going over the fence. Oh, we're not trying to, Dad. I said, I know, but you're choosing to throw snowballs that direction. That's your choice. But the consequences are some of them are going over the fence. Yeah, we'll be more careful. Well, let me ask you, what are some of the consequences of a, a snowball going over the fence? And they're little. We could hit somebody walking. You could. That would be bad. What else? Uh, Well, we could hit a car. That would be unpleasant. Wouldn't be too damaging. What else? They said, I don't know. And I said, what if a car swerves and hits a kid on the sidewalk because it slides on the ice because of your snowball? They hang their heads. All right, we'll stop playing. So they didn't say stop playing. Why don't you throw snowballs this direction so they go in the neighbor's yard or they go in our yard? You have control of your actions, sons. You don't have control of the consequences. Just think through the consequences before you do something. So they've heard that their whole life. That's something I remind myself often in the mirror, and that's something my wife often reminds me of. We do have control of our actions. We don't have control of our consequences. Sometimes actions, like what if, for example, I would have at that biscuit house gone over at the biscuit house, gone over and just engaged those guys. I'm not afraid of confrontation, but I probably had in the back of my mind I was going to set them some sort of straight. Now, even if I spoke calmly, even if I was rational and of superior intelligence, right? Okay. Um, (laughs) What happens after that conversation? What are some of the consequences? And I started thinking, it's only about three gossips away from, and down south, that's not far, three gossips, that's about 23 minutes. Did you see the pastor from that church? He just blew up and was yelling at those guys. He was letting them have it. He was out of control. It's the most embarrassing thing. And then you get to go Sunday and hear people say, I heard about you, I'll be praying for you, right? Been there. Um, we have to be careful with our words, not just how we engage, but when we engage. And I wanted to mention that story because if God puts on your heart to say something, we are compelled to say it. What did he tell Ezekiel? Ezekiel says, hey, these people aren't listening. I'm paraphrasing here, as always. And God says, no, no, you you don't understand. I don't care if they listen. I care that you do what I tell you to do. I will hold you accountable for saying exactly what I tell you to say. You're not responsible for what they do. Again, we get to control our actions, not the consequences. Another proverb I like, a wise heart instructs its mouth and increases learning with its speech. A wise heart instructs its mouth and increases learning with its speech. So there's, um, it's a, when I see these things in the Bible, I think, okay, am I being led with my mind? And then we'll be enemies. I'm not trying to do the whole dichotomy of man thing. I'm not, I don't, that's a bad debate because I'll lose and then we'll be enemies. But We are often led with how we think, and then sometimes we're led with how we feel, and obviously both are always a factor in our decisions. But this is telling me that my heart should instruct my mouth, and we know many Proverbs, many verses about from the overflow of a man's heart, your words, what comes out. But I also think there's a a need for us to 
use our mind when it comes to our words, to our tongue, to expand our vocabulary. Obviously, the Bible is the best reading out there. I tell my sons all the time, one of them, Josh, really loves history. I said, if you want to know everything you can know about history, read history, study it, learn it. It'll tell you everything that happened. Read the Bible, it'll tell you why it happened. Those two together are very powerful documents. History, Bible. But when we stop and expand our vocabulary, and we expand our ability to communicate, our words take on additional power. Our words can be very powerful. You know that, you feel that, you're the recipient of that. I'm going to toss you something today I learned, I don't know how many years ago, but it was a, uh, it was a, a class, and I, I don't remember the kind of expression, maybe you've heard it thousands of times, and I've, I've taught this many times. If you have the slide, there's an expression, maybe you've heard it, I didn't say he shot his wife. It's a pretty simple expression, right? I didn't say he shot his wife. There are seven different meanings within that sentence. Now, I'm mentioning this today because our words are important. The way in which we communicate is important. And if we seek to acquire mastery of our words, and our words are often our tone, we can, we can change the perception and shape the perception of somebody we're trying to encourage. We can counsel or admonish somebody with a little bit more gentleness if we know how and where to use our voices. For example, if I say, I didn't say he shot his wife. That's just, I didn't say it. What if I say, I didn't say he shot his wife. Maybe somebody else said it. I didn't say he shot his wife, just an emphatic denial. I didn't say he shot his wife. Somebody else must have shot her. I didn't say he shot his wife. Maybe he stabbed her to death. I didn't say he shot his wife. He clearly shot somebody else's wife. I didn't say he shot his wife. He shot the neighbor or somebody. One simple sentence, you can change your inflection and you change what the receiver hears. If you read that, you take away whatever meaning you want. When it's spoken, you take away seven different interpretations from the same thing. If we work on how we pace and how we say with the intent of, to me, number one, I'll tell you guys, number one for me is I love sharing the gospel. I absolutely love sharing the gospel. I particularly love and enjoy, and, and I get passionate. I get those Holy Spirit tingles when I get to share uh, evangelism or, or the truth with uh, Mormons. Really excited about that. Uh, Orthodox Jews, Jehovah's Witness. Part of that is because I dated people from all three of those religions for at least a year and a half, and I understood and went to their church, and I did all the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of Covenants, you know, and the, the Book of Mormon, and the Watchtower. But in, in I was never interested in any of those things, but I was interested in the girls that made me go to those churches with them so I could date them. Further reminder, God, well, I take a path of action in my 20s, and then 15, 20 years later, God says, hey, what you think you were doing there, let me show you what it's really for. <laughs> Pointing to me, God can recover my worst mistakes. And they were, they were terrible decisions at the time, but even my worst decisions are not lost on God. But I, 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 I love doing that, and I will tell you, if, if we work on our ability to communicate, it's important what the hearer says. One of the, the instructional things in Navy, when we talk about communication, the definition of communication requires a message, it requires comprehension, and it requires feedback. If I say something and assume you understood, that's probably not going to go as well. If I say something and you tell me what you heard, I know whether it's what I intended to say or not. I'm finding this works really well with my sons. When I speak, they mostly give me back what I thought I heard. Um, my youngest is a sophomore. We have a habit of going to breakfast. We try to go once a week. So yesterday we're at Chick-fil-A, and, and I said a couple things, and he told me back what he thought he heard. And I'm like, that's not what I said. Happens rarely with my sons. Now, when, guys, when we cross the male to female conversation, it's really good to make sure that what we said is what they heard voice of experience. I got scars on that one. But the important thing is communication takes two people. It takes a speaker, it takes a receiver, and then it takes confirmation. There's a verse here that I'm going to jump to now because it is one that, uh, there's many verses in the Bible, but this is one that, that does linger with me, and I don't like it, and it's something Jesus said, so I put it in red, because that's what you do when you're a Christian. You put Jesus' words in red. I don't know who created that, but it's kind of cool. Um, I tell you, that's me, on the day of judgment, people will give account, that's me too, for every careless word they speak. For by your words, 
you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Many applications of that. Plenty. But the only application I have to worry about in the next hour is me. How does that apply to me in the next hour? Am I bashing those God created because they don't fit my social, political, ideological agenda? Do I carelessly, in a moment of frustration on something, uh, greet somebody in, in a manner that, that leaves them feeling ill? Do I need to encourage somebody, but I just don't have time? Love this poster. Speak when you're angry, and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. That's in your questions later, and I've been there, so that's a, kind of an expert on that one, too. I'm going to jump back over to the James 3, verse 1 and 2 again. Consider how large a small fire ignites, how large a forest a small fire ignites. Coming from California, pretty familiar with that. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, not just a, you know, a city or a county or a state or a country, it's a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. Every sea creature, reptile, bird, animal is tamed and has been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> you can't tame your tongue. The Bible says it. I cannot tame my tongue. I've tried, but I can't. So what do we do? Do we just recklessly run around, you know, firing sore, firing arrows and and slashing people with the, the knife that we call a tongue with our words. If I'm not capable, why does James paint this realistic, disturbing, and troubling visual of what the tongue is? And it says, oh, but there's nothing you can do about it. Well, because it's true. So what are we left to do? I love the bumper sticker verses we see a lot, and they, they have a lot of meaning. One of my favorites I can do all things through Christ. Can I tame my tongue? No. Nah. Can the Holy Spirit tame my tongue? <clears throat> what can God not do? My God's big enough to tame my tongue. The problem is, will I let him? It's the same problem I run against all the time. Sometimes, once in a while, in a flash of my fleshliness, I'm pretty sure I'm more knowledgeable than God, and I know what needs to happen to people and to me, and to my life. And then the only difference between walking in joy through hardship and pain, whether self-inflicted or externally inflicted, is the period of time it takes me to step back and say, I'm not God. It's from the outburst to the moment of humilities that, that, that changes the trajectory. I am going to make mistakes in this life, probably in the next 20 minutes. The period of time from which I repent of that, that I recognize where I'm headed or what I've done, or where I'm not heading and should go and don't, that time lapse is the direct indicator of the joy in my life. Because I will have hardship and trouble in this world. I will make mistakes every day. I will say things I shouldn't say. I'll not say things I should. Because I cannot control my tongue. But the period of time time again that lapses between those failures and my immediate turning to Christ will shorten that period and reduce the, re the frequency, reduce the recurrence. I don't know about you guys, but every once in a while I'll be about to say something. And I actually, I, this is not a boast, I'm saying this in, in just admitting that, that I can be a total loser. But my God isn't. Every once in a while God will be like, nope. And it feels good. It feels really good. Other times I'll be somewhere and I need to say something. This sounds weird. It's easier for me to, to speak challenging things to a stranger than to someone I really care about. Because if I really care about somebody, I have to say something that, that, I, that God has put on my heart and that I, I don't think it's going to be received with hugs and thank yous. That's tough. That's tough. I also know that in those times, my desire to be liked by those I care about is going to override what God wants me to do. So can I tame my tongue? Tame doesn't mean always keep quiet. Tame means sometimes get to work. 
We don't tame animals so that they can just sit there docilely and do what we want them to do. We practically tame them so that we can put them to work, plowing, harvesting, searching, service animals. We tame them so they can be of use, not so they can just lay there dead. Training our tongue doesn't mean simply withholding the negatives. It doesn't mean just simply not bashing Steve's picture. It means stepping in and engaging with one of the most powerful tools we have. God has given us our words. When we try to make those his words, amazing things can happen. And the only barrier is us in between. Got a few questions for you this morning. Um, Going to give you a little bit more time to talk. What are some of the reasons it's so difficult to control our words? Um, I had that up there and I deleted it. Because that's just a circuitous conversation of what is common. We all know why we can't contain our words. And if, you, if, if, if the tables, if I would have left that question up there, I had it. What are some of the reasons it's so difficult to control our words? Uh, it's me. And it's you. No matter what our answers to that question, I wrote, I'm like, well, that's kind of a, 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 a simple answer. It's always going to be us. The reason I can't contain or control my words at times is me. Can't blame on anybody else. So I removed that one. That was a gimme. You all get an A on that question. Share an example when the words of another encouraged or sustained you during a difficult time. What are some of the unintended consequences of speaking without thinking and losing control of our tongues that maybe you've experienced? Been the receiver or the sender of that one. And then share an action or maybe an inaction that you need to take following today based on the conversation you're going to have at your tables. What my hope is during this conversation time, and I wanted to make it longer than we typically do, so it's that we got 7.05, gives you about 20, 25 minutes. I really want at the tables, my desire this morning for you at your tables is that you share openly about this, and then when we leave, or even while we're still sitting here, let this inform how you're going to live for the next one hour. And when that's over, say, I think I can go another. And if we're not careful, it's going to be 8 in the evening, and we're still going to be working along this path. And forbid, my gosh, let's not do this every day and have it become a habit. But I want you to leave here with at least one thing today, that for the next hour, you are going to focus on that with you and using your words. All right, guys, let's get to work.